Hey guys, welcome back to Midwits Made Simple. In this video, we're going to see about diuretics. Now, let's begin. Diuretics are the drugs which act on kidneys and they helps in increased production of urine. This is a picture showing nephron, which is the functional unit of kidneys. Nephron basically helps in the production of urine. You need to know the various parts of the nephron in order to understand the functions of diuretics. So, initially there is a afferent arteriole which helps in the formation of glomerular capillary network and from that arises the afferent arteriole. So the glomerulus is surrounded by the glomerular capsule, then from there proximal convoluted tubule arises and from that the loop of Henle starts. The loop of Henle has a descending limb and an ascending limb. The ascending limb is further divided into thin ascending limb and a thick ascending limb. From that arises the distal convoluted tubule, followed by which finally is the collecting ducts. So you need to know the various parts of the nephron in order to, in order to understand the act mechanism of actions and the various side effects of the diuretics. The most important diuretics which we need to know are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, thiazides, loop diuretics. SGLT2 inhibitors, adenosine A2 antagonists. Now let's see one by one. First, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme which is present in proximal convoluted tubules. So it helps in this the following reaction. It helps in the conversion of carbonic acid, which is H2CO3 to water and carbon dioxide, and it also helps in the reverse reaction. So it is basically a reversible reaction, which is mediated by this carbonic anhydrase enzyme. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors will block this step and it will prevent the conversion of carbonic acid to water and carbon dioxide. So it cannot be reabsorbed back into the, um, into the nephron. So what happens is the carbonic acid, which is produced in, which is there in excess, is, will get excreted in urine in the form of sodium bicarbonates. Example of carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is acetazolamide. Now about the pharmacokinetic part. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are active orally. A single dose which is given in the morning can last the whole day. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are excreted by kidneys by the secretion process in proximal convoluted tubules. Now in the cases of renal insufficiency or any renal disease in any patients, dose, dose reduction is essential, otherwise many toxic effects can arise. And there are other uses of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors apart from being used as diuretics. So that include glaucoma, CSF leakage, acute mountain sickness and they can also be used as adjuvant in epilepsy. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors have a very significant role in the treatment of glaucoma especially. The main adverse drug reactions of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors include hypersensitivity which is common for many drugs and the features include rash, bone marrow suppression, allergic symptoms etc. They also cause metabolic acidosis. Now how this occurs? This is because all or almost most of the bicarbonates are excreted in the urine so there is lack of uh, the basic material or base in the blood and that leads to increase in the acid levels which will lead to the production of metabolic acidosis. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors will also predispose for the development of renal stones. The contraindication for using um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors is cirrhosis in this case, it can lead to the development of hepatic encephalopathy due to accumulation of various toxic products such as ammonia. Now we'll see about loop diuretics which are the very important diuretic group. So the side of action of the loop diuretic is the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. As we saw the anatomy of loop of Henle, it had a descending limb and thin ascending limb and thick ascending limb. So the side of action of loop diuretics is the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. So these are the most efficacious diuretics. So these are the most preferred diuretics in most of the cases. Examples of loop diuretics include 
furosemide and ethacrylic acid. Now, the other thing which you need to know is that most of the loop diuretics such as furosemide or sulfonamide derivatives, so you must be aware of cross allergy between various drugs which are sulfonamide derivatives too. So you'll be aware of the sulfonamide antibiotics. So these drugs are known to cause so many allergic symptoms. So if you find uh, allergic, allergic features to a sulfonamide antibiotic, you should avoid giving um, sulfonamide loop diuretics to that patient. So if a patient is allergic to sulfonamide antibiotics, furosemide should be avoided to prevent cross allergy which can be very severe. They are well absorbed orally so they can be given orally and they are excreted by kidneys. So the, the transporter on which they act is the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter which is present in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and they also facilitate the excretion of magnesium and calcium by indirect mechanisms. However, hypocalcemia will not occur even though calcium excretion is facilitated because there are other compensatory mechanisms to overcome this but hypomagnesemia is a complication. The furosemide, the main use of furosemide is acute pulmonary edema. So the drug of choice for acute pulmonary edema, which is a life-threatening condition, is furosemide, which you all need to know. The other indication for loop diuretics are acute hypercalcemia. I told you why. It's because they facilitate the excretion of calcium, so they can be used in acute hypercalcemia. They can also be used in conditions of anion, anion overdose, such as in bromide or fluoride overdose to help excrete them and they can also be used in heart failure to reduce the cardiac workload. The toxicity are basically based on the mechanism of action of these drugs. I'll tell you how. The loop diuretics will facilitate the excretion of sodium, potassium as well as chloride. So the potassium levels in the blood will start to decrease which will lead to hypokalemia and th there will also be a decrease in the acid levels in the blood which will lead to the development of metabolic alkalosis. So that's what led to this condition hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis and these are a group of drugs which can cause ototoxicity. So it's a very common question like you'll find a question asking what are the ototoxic drugs so you can add loop diuretics to that list and the other drugs which are very commonly uh, used but they are known for their ototoxic features um, is aminoglycoside antibiotics so the other toxic effects include hyperuricemia which is due to impaired excretion of uric acid so the uric acid will not be excreted properly and will start to accumulate in the blood leading to hyperuricemia. Hypomagnesemia, as I have told you earlier, magnesium gets excreted in excess, so leading to hypomagnesemia. And as usual, allergy. Now let's see about the thiazides. The side of action of thiazides is distal converted tubule. So they act on sodium chloride transporter and they inhibit that transporter. Example of thiazide diuretic include chlorothiazide. Thiazides are used in conditions such as hypertension, heart failure, nephrolithiasis, and a very interesting condition known as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So, if you haven't read about nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, please do read about it because it's so interesting. Read about those receptors, vasopressin receptors, B1A, B1B, B2 and the sites on which they are present so that that's so the pathophysiology of the diabetes insipidus is so interesting. So the toxicity of thiazides include uh, almost similar to loop diuretics like there is hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, hyperuricemia and here you see there is impaired carbohydrate tolerance. This is because thiazide diuretics will impair the release of insulin from the beta cells of pancreas. So they basically activate the ATP sensitive potassium channels in the beta cells of 
uh, pancreas. So that will cause hyperpolarization of those cells and that will decrease the release of insulin from the beta cells. And this will lead to hyperglycemia. It will also lead to development of hyperlipidemia, hyponatremia due to ex increased sodium excretion and as usual allergy. Now let's see about potassium sparing diuretics. The side of action of these drugs is the collecting tubules mainly. So there are many mechanisms by which they act. Some drugs such as spironolactone and eplanolone act directly on the mineral cortical receptors and inhibit them. And some drugs um, such as amyloride act straight directly on the epithelial sodium channels and they prevent the reuptake and facilitates the excretion of sodium in the urine. So those drugs don't have action on mineral cortical receptors. So there's one more drug in this group which is nesuritide which increases glomerular filtration rate and increases sodium excretion and this drug should be given only intravenously. The uses of potassium sparing diuretics are mainly in conditions where there are excess of mineral corticoid such as in primary hyperaldosteronism and they are often used in combination with other diuretics to decrease potassium loss. You would have seen in the toxic effects of other diuretics, they all had hypokalemia as a toxic effect. In order to overcome that, the potassium sparing diuretics are given in combination with them to overcome hypokalemia. However, if these drugs are given alone due to excess retention of the potassium, what happens is hyperkalemia will develop. The other side effects are hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, gynecomastia. Gynecomastia is because um, the drugs which were aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone and eplanoron where um, they are synthetic steroids. So as you all know steroids can have this side effect which is gynecomastia. And acute renal failure is a rare side effect associated with these drugs. Now there, there are some other groups of uh, diuretics which are not significant to know but it's quite interesting about the, the mechanism of action. So there are this group, there, there is this group which is SGLT2 inhibitors which is sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors. So the SGLT2 receptor is present in kidneys in the proximal convoluted tubules so they reabsorb almost 90% or almost the entire glucose which is filtered from the glomerulus so as you all know glucose is osmotically active it helps in retention of water inside the cavity in, inside the lumen so when this drug is when this receptor is inhibited the glucose will not be reabsorbed back into the blood so all the glucose will remain in the uh, lumen of the nephron and this will keep the water with it so m much of the water is excreted in the urine this is the mechanism of action of these drugs so they are orally well uh, they are absorbed orally so they can be given orally examples of these drugs include dapagliflozin and canaliglifluzin um, these drugs are basically the third line choice of um, third line drug of choice for diabetes mellitus. So they also have effects such as weight loss which is beneficial in these patients and they also helps in lowering glycate and hemoglobin levels. However, they are not the, the most preferred drugs for treatment of diabetes because there are better drugs such as metformin which are still the most preferred drugs for treatment of diabetes mellitus. Now let's see about adenosine A1 receptor antagonists. The adenosine A1 receptor antagonists will, helps in, will help in preventing tubular glomerular feedback. So what's this? This tubular, uh, tubular glomerular feedback occurs due to uh, increased sodium excretion in the urine following use of any diuretic. So what happens is, for example, let's consider thiazide diuretics. When you give thiazide diuretics, what happens is there will be excess of sodium loss in the urine. So this will be sensed by the macula densa which is present in the nephron and they send signals to the afferent arterioles. So that will cause constriction, vasoconstriction of the afferent arterioles and 
the amount of blood reaching uh, the glomerulus will get decreased due to vasoconstriction and that decreases GFR okay so this is the mechanism by which the tubular glomerular feedback will decrease the glomerular filtration rate however when you give this drug uh, which is adenosine A1 receptor antagonist that will block the tubular glomerular feedback and will help in increasing glomerular filtration rate and urine production example of this group of drug is rolofilin this drug is now basically withdrawn because it had much of CNS toxicity and renal toxicity. Now osmotic diuretics. The site of action of osmotic diuretics are proximal convoluted tubules, descending limb of loop of Henle and collecting duct. These drugs are administered intravenously only so you should not give these drugs orally. When you give osmotically active drugs such as osmotic diuretics orally, what happens is when they enter the gastrointestinal tract, they'll start to pull water inside the gastrointestinal tract which will, um, which will decrease the consistency of the stools and patients will start developing diarrhea rather than getting the desired effect. So they should be administered only intravenously to get the desired effect. They are excreted by kidneys. So when you give osmotic diuretics, the water loss is more than sodium loss, okay? So the osmotic diuretics which are present in the nephrons will start to pull the water to the lumen of the nephrons. So they do not affect sodium loss much. So water loss is more than sodium loss. So in the blood, what happens is there will be decreased amount of water, but the sodium levels remain unchanged. So what happens? There, um, there will be relative hypernatremia so that's not good that's a side effect of osmotic diuretics osmotic diuretics are used to reduce intracranial pressure they can be used to reduce intraocular pressure and few nephrologists prefer to use osmotic diuretics for patients um, who are going to who are going to be started on dialysis to prevent the adverse effects of dialysis the toxicity of osmotic diuretics are um, as so like they cause dehydration which is due to excessive water loss it's so apparent that they cause dehydration and they also cause hyperkalemia and hypernatremia they basically do not increase the levels but since water level is low uh, it will seem like the potassium levels and sodium levels are increased so they are a relative hyperkalemia and relative hypernatremia there are other drugs which are used as diuretics such as ADH agonists which is vasopressin and ADH antagonists which includes vaptans such as tolvaptan. Visit patreon.com slash midwits may simple and help us make more videos by donating us and you can download our lecture slides by visiting this site. Please subscribe to our channel midwits may simple and like share and subscribe for, for more videos. Thank you.